Across America, BP supports more than 275,000 jobs to keep energy flowing. Jobs like expanding capacity for biodiesel in Washington state and reducing operational emissions in the Gulf of Mexico. It's and, not or. See what doing both means for energy nationwide at bp.com slash investing in America. The stress and crowds of holiday shopping can put a damper on your holiday spirit, and you don't always find all the perfect gifts you're looking for. The Virginia Lotteries games make easy and tremendously fun gifts for all the adults in your life. Even you. Spruce up your gift-giving game this holiday season with the Virginia Lottery. The Virginia Lottery's holiday scratchers are a gift any adult will love. Treat yourself to some winter wonderment and play the Lottery's holiday online instant games from anywhere in Virginia. Visit valottery.com slash holiday. Please gift responsibly. Lottery games are not for minors. Hey, it's Ryan Holiday, host of the Daily Stoic Podcast. When I bought my first house in 2013, part of the way I paid for it was we would rent it out on Airbnb in Austin when there was South by Southwest or F1 or ACL. And then later when that tiny little house became my office, I would work there, I'd do my writing during the week. Then on the weekends, we'd rent it out to people who were coming in from out of town on Airbnb. And you may be sitting on an Airbnb and not even know it. You've probably had the same experience. You stayed in an Airbnb and thought, this is doable. Maybe I could rent my place on Airbnb. And it's really that simple. You can start with a spare room or you can rent your whole place. Maybe you're traveling to see friends and family for the holidays. While you're away, your home could be an Airbnb. Your home might be worth more than you think. Find out at airbnb.com slash host. Content warning, this episode contains discussion of the murder of two girls as well as the topic of suicide. If you or someone you know is suicidal, then please consider calling the 988 hotline, that is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, to get help. Well, by now you've probably heard what happened in court today. We had another hearing that wasn't. In the Delphi case. In the Delphi kind case. of a common theme here. And the end result of it, as I'm sure you've heard, is that Richard Allen's defense attorneys, Andrew J. Baldwin and Bradley Rosie, have chosen to withdraw from the case. So that's what you've heard. We are going to be trying in this episode to talk a little bit more about that. We were there at this hearing and tell you what we think it might mean and where things might go from here. My name is Anya Kane. I'm a journalist. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. I'm an attorney. And this is The Murder Sheet. We're a true crime podcast focused on original reporting, interviews, and deep dives into murder cases. And this is The Delphi Murders. Defense attorneys Andy Baldwin and Brad Rosie withdraw. Let's start by giving some context. One thing that we felt was pretty clear going into this hearing is that it was obviously going to deal in large part with this serious leak of crime scene photos that happened uh, recently. Uh, and I think it's important to note something that often gets overlooked is that this leak was not just crime scene photos. The person who accessed materials at the criminal defense team office also was picking up details about the defense team's strategy and their plans and the information the defense team was getting from the prosecution. For instance, we got a sense of who they were planning to next accuse of being a possible Odinist. Yes, all of this was in this massive breach. 
And it was, as I say, it was pretty clear that's what this was going to be talked about at the hearing today, especially because Judge Gull actually had gone as far as to issue a protective order around this discovery material, indicating it really had to be protected and safeguarded. It became absolutely, if we were like 99.9999999% sure it was going to be about the leak, that last little sliver of doubt was removed this morning. Uh, what happened is that attorney David Hennessy filed into this case as an attorney for Andrew Baldwin. You might remember David Hennessy. His nickname is Mr. Murder, and we actually interviewed him a couple months ago. We did. It was a great interview, and he's a prominent defense attorney here in Indianapolis. I just think it just sounds like something out of a farce that you have a defense attorney with a defense attorney in a high-profile criminal case. It just it just seems utterly preposterous, and yet that's where we found ourselves this morning. That's where we found ourselves this morning, and Hennessy actually filed uh, – Memorandum regarding possible disqualification or sanctions. And in this memorandum, he concedes, obviously, that he realizes that it is on the table that attorneys Baldwin and Rosie may be removed by the may be removed from the case by Judge Gull. So let's be clear about that. The defense is not contesting the basic facts of the leak. They're not saying that's not what happened. Actually, we think the police leaked it. They're acquiescing. Yes, the leak was caused by one of Andy Baldwin's former employees who accessed improperly discovery materials. They don't really address as much the strategic elements of this where he was leaking things that he was obviously being told by the defense team. But but they're basically saying, we acknowledge all that. We're just arguing it's not our fault because this guy was just doing this without any of our knowledge. Yeah, there's some pretty memorable language in this memorandum. Uh, Hennessy writes, Attorney Baldwin did nothing wrong. He was snookered and abused. Okay, yeah. And they give their uh, version of what happened. And I am going to read that. Uh, Mr. Baldwin trusted a friend to respect his office space. He was betrayed. Since that transgression, Mr. Baldwin has kept all Delphi-related items locked in a room or a locked fireproof file cabinet. Defense counsel has put together a plan for curative action in which no items will be left unattended for even a second in any unlocked room. So they are acknowledging there basically how this leak occurred. But just the leak of... The images. Yes, not not the other things that were mentioned in, in the screenshots that we obtained. So they're addressing that. I imagine that that stuff is perhaps considered a little bit less egregious because it's less concrete. You're bouncing around ideas. Somebody puts two and two together. They realize it's about Delphi. I can maybe see more wiggle room there for the attorneys. And if it had just been about that, I don't think we'd necessarily be seeing the repercussions that we did. Uh, Hennessy also makes an interesting argument. He says, it should be considered that nothing has been disclosed that won't be disclosed at trial or hearings. And obviously there's a difference between something being disclosed in a judicial proceeding or a legal proceeding and something popping up on the YouTube channel of somebody trolling for donations. Yeah. Uh, it's it's hugely different, and also it's basically just saying, yeah, you said it was a protective order, Judge, but uh, who cares? Uh, yeah, I this I I saw what they were trying to do here, and and they certainly certainly portray a you know a compelling argument for uh, Baldwin being a, a victim in this, victimized by his former friend, um, and that's certainly compelling yeah, yeah. emotionally, but uh, legally speaking, it's kind of like. You're just basically saying, yeah, this happened. Yeah, let's be honest. We've been referring to this person who we've been calling M. Perhaps at some point we'll give his name. But we've been referring to him as M. And we've been saying he's a former employee of the firm. And that's true. But it's also true he was a good friend. A dear friend. Yeah, they were close. I mean, this is close. Also, 
Some think people say, oh, maybe they, they, he was disgruntled. He was fired. Maybe that's why he's no longer with the firm. He was he left on his own amicably and continued to be friends with Baldwin afterwards years ago. So at this point, it's a former employee who is now just graduated into pure friend. Exactly. Although I can't even imagine what that relationship is looking like right now because it is a breach of trust. So I guess it's just interesting. Uh, uh, the things that Mr. Hennessy's brief didn't mention, like the uh, disclosures of of strategy that are not explained by someone having one time access to an office that they shouldn't. And then and then just the element of I mean, again, all of this legally speaking, it doesn't it comes down on the attorneys worse because if. If this guy, if M was a current employee who had signed something saying, I agree to not leak anything, then a lot of this would be coming down on him. It would certainly look bad for the defense, but they could say, listen, we went through the proper channels. You know, this guy had access. He was supposed to have access. The judge approved it. We're all good. But this is not what happened here. And also another thing that jumped out at me, and I think when we were discussing this earlier, you said this does jumped out at you as well. Yeah. Uh, Hennessy, says, Hennessy says there were three disseminators. Yes. In other words, he's saying there were three people who were spreading this information. And I'm going to give you my opinion. Uh, my opinion is that's just not true. That's minimizing things to an insane degree. I, I think you can either argue that there was one disseminator, and that disseminator was the friend, the former employee who who took this material, or you could say there's a ton of disseminators. Yeah, I agree. Because once this material got out there and into the hands of certain people, it began circulating widely. Yeah, it's like they're trying to minimize it by making it sound like, okay, well, three, you know, that's that sounds pretty manageable. Uh, yeah, the, the original leaker, the person who, who would be in the most trouble for this is M. Again, that's not the guy we got the photos from. Our, our sources, Mark, he and M are different people, as we've talked about. But M is the original leaker. That's where it seems to have come from. That's who the defense has acknowledged. This is where it came from. But to act like only three people ended up getting it and disseminating it, I think, you know, we're aware that R, the person between our source, Mark, and M, who unfortunately died by suicide, he... He says in, in the messages we've reviewed that he sent it to at least one other person. And that person sent it to untold numbers. Yeah. It, it's gotten out widely, unfortunately. So I, I think the defense is minimizing the situation here. They have to because that's what they're arguing. We should be able to stay on. But in this brief, you see the defense fighting for their lives. Yeah, in this memorandum, Hennessy says basically the judge doesn't even have the authority to remove a bald one from counsel. It's just a wrong thing to do. He is really arguing strongly and very well because he's a very good attorney. We've, yeah, we've interviewed. It's him compelling. Before. I mean, like, I regardless of how we feel personally about this, he's putting together an argument. He's saying, "Here's all the reasons Baldwin and Rosie should stay," and. We're acknowledging there was a huge mistake, but we're also saying we're going to take corrective actions. So it's a pretty strong argument. So at least as of the time this was filed, the plan was for the defense attorney to fight and to fight vigorously to remain as counsel for Richard Allen. And that's not what happened today. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about what happened today. There was a hearing scheduled for 2 p.m. Uh, most reporters who plan to cover this hearing, including us, uh, gathered in a, a hallway outside the courtroom hours earlier, hours earlier. And it's a crowded, crowded hallway with people talking. And at one point, a few hours, maybe two hours before the hearing was scheduled to begin, uh, Andrew Baldwin with his counsel, David Hennessy, uh, or walk down the hallway to where the judge's chambers is. Yeah. Do you want to describe uh, Andy Baldwin's uh, countenance? He, he looked really sad. He looked, he looked, I mean, that's how I would characterize it, sad, perhaps feeling defeated. Again, that's speculation. We're, we're not in his head. We're reading this, but, I mean, we're reading into it, but we're also saying, like, you know, ultimately he's a human being, and, and this is, I imagine... 
a difficult, very difficult professional situation to be in. And a personal situation. Yeah, very true. If if we take him at his word, and there's no evidence that what he's telling us is not accurate, if or if we take him at his word, he was betrayed rather massively by a friend, someone he trusted. And he's having to deal with enormous consequences of that. And also, I'd like to say that I have no special knowledge, but just from watching Andy Baldwin in court over this last year, it's become clear to me when I see him interact with Richard Allen, or when I see him interact with Richard Allen's wife or mother, he cares about these people. He cares about them deeply. And so I imagine it must be painful to him to be contemplating the possibility that he wouldn't be able to continue to work on their behalf. Yeah. It, it's a, it's a hugely shocking thing. And for, for the people who like us are observers, like reporters, but I'm sure for the people involved, it's even more shocking and devastating emotionally. So let's not forget that there's humans at the heart of this story, even though we're talking about legal matters. And even though we don't want to undermine the seriousness of this breach, because it was, this should never have happened. And there are just enormous aftershocks and consequences. But, but with that said, no matter how you feel about the breach, uh, it's, it's, it's a sad thing for him to be in this situation. I think so, too. At The Murder Sheet, we spend so much time digging into crime stories that sometimes it's difficult to find the time to plan out and cook elaborate, nutritious meals. That's why we are so excited about our sponsor, Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service. Our sponsors make this podcast possible. So if you go to factormeals.com slash msheet and use our special code msheet, you're not just getting half off this high-quality meal plan. You're supporting us too. So I'm obsessed with Factor. I had their creamed corn chicken and their tomato basil chicken risotto recently. Both were delicious. That risotto in particular was amazing. Plus, the whole process was a breeze. All I had to do was pop the meal into the microwave. The food was tasty and flavorful, which is no surprise given that each recipe is specifically crafted by chefs and approved by dietitians. Having Factor during the hectic holiday season has been a boon, especially with us pumping out so many episodes. Head to factormeals.com slash msheet and use code M sheet to get 50% off. That's code M sheet at factormeals.com slash M sheet to get 50% off. Have you heard? You can listen to your gripping investigations ad free. Good news. With Amazon Music, you have access to the largest catalog of ad free top podcasts included with your Prime membership. To start listening, download the Amazon Music app or visit amazon.com slash true crime ad free. That's amazon.com slash true crime ad free. And catch up on the latest episodes without the ads. Imagine all your audio entertainment available in just one place. That's what the Audible app is all about. With Audible, you can always find the best of what you love or discover something new. Audible has an incredible selection of mystery and thriller titles and originals, like Something Ain't Right by Roger Stringer and Zachary Stringer, The Space Within by Greg O'Connor and Josh Fagan, and the Audible original Moriarty. Membership includes access to Audible originals, podcasts, and tons of audiobooks that you can download or stream as much as you want. And as an Audible member, you can choose one title per month from an ever-growing catalog of titles to keep. The Audible app makes it easy to listen anytime, anywhere, whether you're traveling, working out, doing chores, wherever your day takes you. New members can try Audible now free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash thrill or text thrill to 500-500. That's audible.com slash thrill or text thrill to 500-500 to try Audible free for 30 days. So then Baldwin seemingly went into the judge's chambers. And that's a situation where we're we're obviously not flies on the wall and we weren't, you know, listening at the doors or anything. I didn't hear anything. It's a situation where it's going to be the attorneys all together, McClelland, Rosie, Baldwin, and Judge Gall. 
they all have to meet together, right? They can't, no one can just kind of go off and have little side meetings, right? Yeah, that's correct. That's the rules. So obviously that's going to be, I wish I knew what went down in there, but I mean, I, I think we had the sense that, um, again, this was going to be very not well received by the court, I guess, to say it in a very mild way, because this is Judge Gull's order, you know, the, the protection, the protective order on the discovery and to have it leak out in this way and have it be crime scene images, you know, to the Internet. It, it's just it's bad. And when you also have it being traced directly back to a person who really had no business having access to any of this, I think that's going to kind of increase the temperature around the reaction, I guess, to, to say it. Yeah, I agree. This was a very serious situation and everything we heard behind the scenes is that it was being taken very, very seriously. I think on one of our earlier episodes discussing this, we said that there was a strong possibility that Baldwin and or Rosie would be removed. And we assure you, we don't say that sort of thing lightly. No, that's if that was a remote possibility, we wouldn't have even brought that up because it would be like, well, that's probably not going to happen. But, you know, we kind of know what's going on in this case. And we also understand that since these two men, these attorneys, they're appointed by the court. So there are different essentially considerations when you have a situation like that versus a situation where Richard Allen is saying, listen, this is my money. I want them to represent me. You can't just take them away. That would have made it more complicated as far as our understanding is talking with people who are experts and don't have a connection to this case, but certainly have a lot of insight into these, you know, kind of complicated legal matters. But in this case, it's like she brought them in uh, and then this happened. And it's on top of a scenario where, you know, there's there's been a gag order. I believe we discussed briefly the Woodhouse leak in a previous episode. That was uh, essentially an accidental leak of a discovery product. So certainly not that serious in comparison. But we're just adding these things together. And Kevin and I are imagining, okay, this is not going to get a very good reception. Even if it was not directly ordered or perpetrated by either Baldwin or Rosie. And goodness knows we have not seen any evidence pointing directly at them. All we're seeing is it goes back to this guy, M, who was a close associate of Baldwin, hasn't worked there in years, and yet somehow was able to do this. Now, I'm going to talk a bit about what actually happened inside the courtroom. The courtroom was opened a little after 1 p.m. I I know in a minute, Anya's going to talk about some of the things she observed uh, between like Kathy Allen and Richard Allen's mother and the like. But before she does that, I want to mention that before we had been in this room for not that long at all, uh, a group of people came in and sat down and this group included superintendent of the Indiana State Police Doug Carter, Carroll County Sheriff uh, Tony Liggett, prosecutor, Carroll County prosecutor investigator Steve Mullen, and uh, Indiana State Police Sergeant Jerry Holman. Holman, of course, was the person in charge of investigating this leak. And Later on in the proceedings, uh, Prosecutor McClellan would say that he was prepared and had brought witnesses. And so I think it's clear that he was prepared to offer a detailed look at this leak and how it happened. I don't know if uh, Doug Carter was going to be a witness for that or not, but I think just the fact that Doug Carter was there, this is an extraordinarily busy man with a very important job. And the fact that he felt it was worth his time to come and attend this hearing really underscores how important the Indiana State Police believed this hearing to be. Yeah, that kind of shows you, I mean, just to be blunt, when he walked in, I think a lot of people were like, oh, wow, what is going to happen? And that's a fair reaction because he's not just going to go to some random hearing. 
And they really showed in force, you know, like the brass was there. And so, yeah, we, we took note of that. And we also took note of in, in front of us, a few rows in front of us, um, was sitting Kathy Allen, Richard Allen's wife, who has stood by him and has attended all of his hearings, as well as Richard Allen's mother. And so these two women, again, they've been through this whole thing with him, uh, not necessarily, you know, together. They're not in prison, but but they're certainly supporting him at all these public hearings. Uh, they're going, they're showing emotion. So at one point, the only uh, defense attorney we saw in this space, or I should say defense attorneys, were Brad Rosie and David Hennessy. They were kind of in and out. And at one point, Brad Rosie went over, or I, I actually, I don't remember. It was either Rosie or Hennessy went and approached Kathy Allen and kind of ushered her through the, you know, past the bench and through a door. We speculate, and we don't know this, but we speculate that maybe that was an opportunity to see her husband, perhaps. Uh, we don't know that, though. So it, she's kind of uh, separated out for a moment. She comes back later on. And this was, you know, at this point, I think we were like, it, it was hard to tell because you can't bring in Apple watches and we weren't sitting close enough to somebody with a watch to really keep an eye on the time. But it was at least 15 minutes past 2 p.m. It was supposed to start at 2 p.m. They're running late. That happens sometimes. But, you know, the crowd's sort of buzzing. Everyone's kind of getting the sense what is going on here. And at some point, Brad Rosie essentially goes over. He does not look happy at all. He goes over, he starts talking to uh, Alan's family and then almost sort of like ushers them out. And at first Kathy goes alone, then her mother-in-law almost kind of goes back, gets their coats and jackets and walks off. And when we saw that, we were like, oh my goodness, like what on earth is happening? Why are they leaving? And... I think relatively shortly after, again, time blurred because, it, you know, it's it's difficult um, when you're just sort of sitting there waiting for something to happen. And uh, Judge Gull comes in and we're like, what's going on? Because normally the, the procedure is Nick McClelland and the defense are seated. And then Judge Gull comes in. In this situation, we have Nick McClelland. We have a man sitting next to Nick McClelland, who I don't know who this man is, and apologies to him to quote the meme, but I don't know who that guy was, but, you know, they're sitting there, but where the heck is the defense? And at first I was like, oh, maybe they're having a conversation in the chambers. Maybe that's still going on. But then Nick McClelland would have to be there. So she goes in and she starts stuff um, and... From there, it's about, like, what, three minutes? It's, like, about a three-minute hearing. And uh, and actually, she says this isn't a hearing at all. Because yeah. Because the defense counsel isn't here because they've withdrawn. Andy Baldwin had filed an oral motion to withdraw. And Brad Rosie is going to file a written motion later. It really makes you wonder what the heck happened here. Because... Again, Kevin and I went into this thinking that there was a strong possibility the defense could be removed because uh, that's just what we understood of the situation. We did not anticipate that they would withdraw on their own because, um, you know, I would I would have expected based on the language of David Hennessy's earlier brief that they would go out fighting and that they would basically cling to their client and cling to this case until the bitter end. And instead – Something obviously happened to change their minds between morning and and then the afternoon. And it makes me wonder about the conversations in chambers that could have occurred, um, possibilities of sanctions, uh, the the pressure of having court TV there, putting this all on camera. You're having, you know, the first situation where this this trial or this pretrial hearing is being filmed in this case and it's going to be basically possibly them getting reprimanded at the very least. So we don't have anything to offer on specific reasons why this happened, but we just want to note that there do does seem to have been a shift in strategy. I will note, I, I know that this all, you know, I, with the conspiracy theorists out there who just love to t 
talk about things they don't understand and, and just speculate wildly about this case because that's very responsible and helpful. I, I, I imagine there's a lot of they were forced out by corrupt officials in this situation. It's kind of complicated because, you know, I get I get thinking that if you're 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 very much on the side of the defense and very much rooting for one team, so to speak, versus another. But when you look at the actual facts of the matter, it's it's a little bit less blurry. You have the defense saying, we acknowledge that Andy Baldwin's former employee, who we call M, did this. He's the guy who did this. We're not really contesting anything that's being put out there in terms of an internal investigation. We're just saying... You shouldn't blame Andy for what M did. And Andy's going to do better and lock stuff up so this doesn't happen again. And, you know, that's that's all well. That's all well and good. But there's no contestion. There's no like, oh, we've been framed or, oh, you guys did this to it. It's it's basically, yeah, this happened and we're going to do better. So to me, I don't really know where the conspiracy comes in. I guess. And and the fact that they withdrew, I would think if they were up against something where they felt it was unfair and they wanted to fight it, they would be – these are people who use – They're fighters. They're fighters. They use all the ammo in their belts. They use every all the tools in their utility belts. I don't see them just being like, oh, well, you know, we've been railroaded by the corrupt system. Now let's trudge sadly out of the courtroom. I, I, I have to think that this was a, a, a decision that I – I, I don't really know what would have prompted it, but I, I don't really see where the conspiracists kind of piece this together based on what we know. What do you think about that? Well, I think one thing that might fuel uh, the conspiracists mm. in this in the future is the lack of openness about the process. I because, agree. That's not ideal. Because basically – a lot of people don't even understand why these two men are no longer on the case. I've seen people speculating about it and they don't realize the connection to the leak. Or they don't want to acknowledge the co- connection to the leak in many cases. I think it would have been better if some of those witnesses had testified and really laid everything out so the public could have the full picture of what happened, both during the leaking of the materials and during the process afterwards. Mm-hmm. I, I think not putting that information out there does a bit of a disservice to the public. And I think it's going to cause some of the conspiracy people to assign blame other than where it should be. I- everybody is human. Everybody makes mistakes. But in this instance, it's not the Indiana State Police, it's not investigator Jerry Holman or Judge Gold or Prosecutor McClelland who made the mistakes. The mistake came from the defense. Yes. And, and it's that's in, not in that's not an issue. And in many ways you can sympathize because the person who betrayed uh, Baldwin and who betrayed Richard Allen and in some sense betrayed the judicial process, that was a friend. And you trust your friends. I certainly trust mine, but uh, it was it was a mistake, and that friend never should have been in a position where he could view these materials, let alone photograph them. Yeah, and I mean the the effects of this are that these photos will, uh, I mean, hopefully never, but you know, could very well be leaked onto the internet and be there forever. And these these are severe consequences. It's disrespectful to the court. It's disrespectful to the victims, and it's disrespectful to Richard Allen. It's a disaster. It's like it's an unmitigated disaster. And I mean, we're. I mean, I think people dismiss this, and it's like, no, this is actually incredibly serious. It's incredibly serious. This is. It, it's incredibly serious, and it's very. That's why we said they might get removed. I never serious. thought they would remove themselves. I really didn't. It's it's very sad, especially since we know these guys are fighters. I thought Baldwin might remove himself to save Rosie. I, I thought that was the that was the wild card scenario for me. I thought he might say, "This is my office. This is my friend. I'm going to take the hit." I don't know how that would have worked out because I I, I I don't even know if that was an option. That may have not been an option. That very well may have not been an option because they're seen as like almost they're one. You know, they're they're a partnership. You can't remove one without the other. 
I don't know how that would have worked. Um, but I'm just throwing it out there. And again, that's someone as like a lay person, I'm wildly speculating. That's a wild speculation scenario. So I understand the need to kind of like, okay, what what would have worked out? But I, I think we have to just the judge was was within her rights to do, you know, to remove them. And and I think that ultimately may have helped prompt a scenario where you could I don't know whether it was you didn't fire me, I quit, or we're going to quit before we have to go into this humiliating ordeal on camera, or we're going to quit because we've contributed to a situation where this has become a complete three-ring circus, and Richard Allen is not being the best, you know, he's not being served by this and have a fresh start, perhaps. There could be all sorts of motivations for that. I don't know. So what's next? What's next is that the hearing scheduled for October 31st is still going to take place. Uh, I think they're going to have try to have a new council appointed then or perhaps before then. Uh, Rosie and Baldwin have been ordered to return all of the discovery materials in their possession to the state. Judge Gull said, you know, somewhat softly that she thought they would comply with that. So that was kind of an interesting aside. And she also in, uh, indicated the defense attorneys will be cooperating with a successor counsel. And at least for the time being, uh, Baldwin and Rosie are still under the gag order. I wouldn't be surprised if that lasts until the end of this case. So they might be able to tell their side of the story, but it may not be for a long time. And I imagine if they feel like any part of this was unfair, that they will feel that's frustrating. Yes. But they would have had more of an opportunity to fight for themselves and potentially tell their side of the story sooner had they stayed on the case. I'm struck by the fact that they seem to uh, differ. Baldwin resigned seemingly orally and never showed up into the courtroom today. We, he, we saw him in the hallway. We never saw him in the courtroom. Whereas Rosie was kind of buzzing around. He was there on the defense side. He was talking to Richard Allen's family. He abruptly left then and we learned that he he'll be know, withdrawing you know in writing. tender a resignation in writing and so i think yeah. i think the final outcome of what happened is not a surprise no but uh the mechanism is yeah we had a feeling that there would be ma massive changes after after this and it's just it's sad it's it just it's a sad situation and again it's going to delay things uh by a long time and I think a lot of people are ready to get this over with. And Richard Allen's incarcerated in a prison. It's just a mess. You know, it's just, I, I'm really, I guess this case shouldn't shock me anymore, but I'm shocked by the turn of events that occurred in October. So obviously there's still much to say, and we'll have more to say about all of this in upcoming episodes. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks so much for listening to The Murder Sheet. If you have a tip concerning one of the cases we cover, please email us at murdersheet at gmail.com. If you have actionable information about an unsolved crime, please report it to the appropriate authorities. If you're interested in joining our Patreon, that's available at www.patreon.com slash murdersheet. If you want to tip us a bit of money for records requests, you can do so at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murder sheet. We very much appreciate any support. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for the murder sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. If you're looking to talk with other listeners about a case we've covered, you can join the Murder Sheet discussion group on Facebook. We mostly focus our time on research and reporting, so we're not on social media much. We do try to check our email account, but we ask for patience as we often receive a lot of messages. Thanks again for listening.